Hi there guys, welcome to a introductory talk on CT. My name is Dr. Muhammad Khan. I'm one of the medical education fellows and I'm also a specialist radiology registrar. So in this session we'll be covering the basics of a CT in terms of why it shows what it shows and then covering common acute cases that you may see as an F1 and F2 just so you're aware of what the common CT findings are. It's also important to know what we won't be covering. So of course we won't be covering the detailed physics because that's beyond what you're expected to know. The detailed anatomy, this is more of a talk on giving you the basics. The obscure pathology, common things are common, so we're going to be focusing on that. In particular, aligning it to what you'll see as an F1 and an F2 and basically avoiding anything boring. So without further ado, let's get cracking. But before we jump in, we're going to have a bit of a pop quiz. So just pause the video, have a go at the questions, and then we'll cover them when we've covered all the content, and then we'll go back and do the questions again. So, I hope you guys had a go at the questions. We'll cover them at the end. So, let's go over the basics of CT. So, let's go over what CT stands for. It stands for computer tomography, basically explaining how the image is taken. Number one, it's done computed because it involves computers running algorithmic equations that are quite complex. Number two, it's done on a basis of tomography. Basically, whatever part of the body you're interested in, let's say CT head, it'll take the image slice by slice from bottom to top, okay, just to cover the image. So it stands for computer tomography. It was invented by 1972 by this gentleman, Godfrey Hounsfield. Remember the last bit that I'll come back later. And it basically runs using x-rays, okay. CT relies on x-rays to actually develop the image and the x-rays pass through the body at multiple angles to give you that 360 view of the image. And you may be asking, well, why should I know about CTs? You're the radiologist, surely that's your job. Number one, you as the foundation year doctor and even junior doctor will be the one requesting them. The consultant will ask you, okay, please go request a CT thorax and you need to understand why you're requesting a CT thorax. So it's best to understand what CT does. Number two, you will often be the first one to report. It's quicker to get a scan done than it is to report one, okay? So often you can open a scan, see a pathology, and be like, okay, I know that's not right. Maybe I need to escalate this with the radiologist so it's reported first. And often you will be the one to act on the CT report. A lot of the time, especially CT heads, when we find pathologies, we write in our report, please speak with a neurosurgeon. And it's not going to be us as the radiologist that speaks to them. It's going to be you guys as the junior doctor. So it's important you know what you're seeing on the CT. But there is a caveat to all this. Nobody expects you to be a hero, right? Nobody wants you to be reporting CT scans or acting on CT scans without a report. And this is particularly true as an F1, F2, okay? Yes, you may see something that you know is wrong, but without the report, it's not a wise move to act on it, okay? What you should do is speak to your senior, involve your registrar from other clinical teams, or involve the radiology registrar, radiology consultant, tell them you're worried about this finding, could this scan be reported quicker? And of course, we're nice people as it is, so we'll listen to your, your comments, and then if appropriate, we'll get the scan to you, the scan report to you quicker than uh, if it wasn't noted to us, okay? So don't act on image findings without waiting for a report. It's not wise. So with that being said and done, let's go over the common orientation and common terminologies you'll encounter when dealing with CT images. So the first one is orientation. One thing you gotta remember is, like you do examinations, you start at the end of the bed. This is how you should approach the actual CT. It's as if you, over here on the right, are looking at the image from the end of the bed, okay? And the, there's a reason for this, because so, 
the right side will then be on your left, okay? And vice versa, the left side of the body will be on your right hand side, okay? And that's because you are viewing the image from the end of the bed here where the asterisk is, okay? In mind, when you're looking at a CT head, as in the case, the right side of the patient is on the left hand side for you, okay? And the patient's left side, for example, the left cerebral cortex that you're looking at here through this image, is going to be on your right hand side. And that's because once again, you're looking at the patient's head, in this case, from the end of the bed. Another thing to know is the orientations. For example, here, this is a transverse section through the abdomen. And then you can see all the abdominal organs, for example, the kidneys, this is the spleen, this is the liver coming in, and of course, probably this is all the bowel. This is a transverse section through the patient, and it's basically a cut through the patient like this, a transverse, basically. This is a coronal and a sagittal section. So a coronal is this uh, blue shaded one here. And once again, this is a CT abdomen, a coronal view. And you can see all the abdominal organs, kidneys over here, spleen, liver. Okay, and once again, this is a coronal section. And a sagittal section, remember, sagittal stands for an arrow. So it's like an arrow going down the body. And this is just a sagittal view of the same CT abdomen, okay? So once again, CT gives you a 360 degree representation of an image. With x-rays, you often only get a 2D appreciation of a 3D image. Yes, you may get two views, you should always get two views, but still it's not the same as a CT where you get a full 360 appreciation. And then you may hear these terminologies when people are discussing CTs, for example, uh, can we get an enhanced CT or we've got an unenhanced CT head? All that basically means is, do you want contrast or no contrast? And contrast is any material, typically in the case of CT imaging iodine, that we give to enhance the uh, certain uh, elements of the scan. For example, typically it's done to enhance the vessels and the appearance of the vessels. So when we say enhanced, what we're saying is, could we get some contrast into the arteries so we can see the arteries and the vasculature better compared to an unenhanced which basically means we don't want any contrast running through the patient at the time of the image being taken and this is an example of a unenhanced over here versus an enhanced on the right side of your screen so this is the same image but one is enhanced i.e. there's contrast running through the vasculature and on the left hand side this is the unenhanced where there is no contrast. So you can see that with the contrast, the vessels are really easy to pick out, okay? And what you're looking at is the middle cerebral artery coming through, okay? Whereas on the unenhanced, it's very difficult to appreciate them, okay? It helps with the enhanced scan, scan on the right, but if it wasn't there, it makes it a lot more difficult to appreciate the vessels, okay? So like I said, enhanced basically refers to a contrast agent being used. And another terminology you may hear is, do you want arterial or a portal venous CT scan? Okay, typically you hear this for CT abdomens or CT thorax, okay? Do you want an arterial chest? Do you want an arterial abdomen? What do you want? Basically, this is asking the radiologist, where do you want the IV contrast? Do you want it in the artery or do you want it in the veins? For this is, is when the contrast is in different parts of the vasculature, i.e. arterial versus venous, the images appear differently. So this is the aorta, okay? And this is an arterial phase. The way you can tell is look at the aorta. It's bright as a light, okay? That means the contrast is running through the arterial system. On the portal venous, this is the same aorta, but it's not as bright because now it's in the venous system, the portal venous system. But look at the appearances of the liver in the two. They're markedly different, okay? On the arterial phase, you can see this pathology and a lot more clear of this possible liver pathology, okay? On the portal venous, something's wrong here, but it's not as clear as the arterial. And this bit is very hard to make out, okay, on the portal venous. So it allows appreciation of different organs, with different phases of contrast in the arterial system versus the portal venous system, okay? And another terminology set you may hear is, do you want a double phase 
or triple phase. This basically describes the images taken at a certain point of the contrast running through either arterial or venous. So when you ask for a double phase, it's basically asking, do you want an arterial and portal venous images? And when you ask for triple phase, you're asking for both one that's unenhanced, i.e. there's no contrast, one with arterial contrast, and the other as portal venous contrast. Basically, with a triple phase, you want three series of images, whereas with a double phase, you want two series of images. Okay, So double phase is arterial and portal venous, and a triple phase is unenhanced, i.e. no contrast, arterial and portal venous. Now that we understand the different terminologies and the orientation for a CT, now let's go through why a CT shows what it shows without boring you with physics. So the key term that you need to get your head around is the concept of the Hounsfield unit. Okay, And it was named after a quite dashing gentleman, Godfrey Hounsfield, who, like we said, invented the CT. And basically the Hounsfield unit reflects the density of the nitum. And it's relative to water, okay? Water is given a Hounsfield unit of zero. Get that in your head, that's very important. When things are more dense than water, they get a more positive Hounsfield unit. And when things are less dense than water, they are given a less positive Hounsfield unit. Try and remember that, but let's try and explain why, okay? And it's all linked to attenuation. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna bore you with physics, but attenuation, basically refers to the proportion of x-rays which pass through. And attenuation is proportional to density, okay? When things are more dense, they are more attenuating, meaning less x-rays pass through, all right? So let's just recap. Hounsfield unit reflects the density of an item relative to water. Things that are more dense get a more positive Hounsfield unit. Things that are less dense than water get a less positive Hounsfield unit. And attenuation, which basically tells you the proportion of x-rays which pass through, is proportional to density. When things are more dense, they are more attenuating, meaning less x-rays pass through. And this is just a nice summary, okay? So like I said, when things are more dense, they have a higher attenuation, less x-rays pass through it, meaning it appears bright on a CT, okay? When things are less dense, have lower attenuation, that means more x-rays can pass through and appears dark on a CT scan, okay? And that is the fundamental principles of CT imaging that you need to get your head around because it'll help understand everything else that you see when it comes to pathology. And this is just a nice table view of what we've just described. So like I said, everything is relative to water, which you can see in the middle here. So water is given a Hounsfield unit of zero, okay? Now, as we go up the table, fat and air are less dense than water, okay? Air is the least dense in this table. That means it is less attenuating, meaning more x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears darker on a CT scan. And look at the Hounsfield unit. A is minus 1,000 and fat is minus 70, reflecting that it is less dense than water. As we go down the table to more dense structures, for example, cerebrospinal fluid, blood, bone calcification, which is the most dense in this table, more dense structures are more attenuating meaning less x-rays can pass through it, meaning that structures appear whiter on a CT image. And here you can see the different hounds field in one single slice. So remember, cerebrospinal fluid is often, majority of the time, composed of water, so is a hounds field unit of zero or relative, relatively close to zero. Now look at the rest of the structures. Here you have a bit of hemorrhage, okay? Hemorrhage consists of blood. Blood is denser than water. And that's why the Hounsfield units are more than water, more positive than water. And why does it appear white? Because blood is dense. That means blood is more attenuating. Less x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears whiter on a CT image. Now look at bone compared to blood. 
bone is a lot more whiter than it is compared to blood, okay? Now why? Because bone is more dense than blood, meaning it's more attenuating than blood, meaning that even less x-rays pass through it compared to blood, meaning that it appears even whiter than blood on a CT. And look at the Hounsfield units. Bone has a Hounsfield unit of plus 1,000, reflecting the density compared to both hemorrhage, i.e. blood, and water. Okay, And look at air at the bottom here. Minus 1,000, and what does it appear as? Black. Because air is not dense, it's not attenuating, meaning a lot of x-rays can pass through it, meaning that it appears dark on a CT image. Okay, So this is just a very clean summary of CT principles and what it reflects like on an image. So now we've discussed the orientation, the terminologies, we've discussed the basic physics, and now you have an understanding of why things look like what they do on a CT. Now let's quickly introduce the concept of windows to you guys and why we often talk about it in radiology. And the thing with windows is, you may hear with the radiologist or even in like MDTs, in orthopedic MDTs, breast surgery MDTs, in nearly all MDTs, you may hear the clinicians asking for a certain window. For example, they, oh, can you put it in the bone window? Can you put it in the stroke window? Basically, what we're asking the person that's looking at the images or manipulating the images, often the radiologist, is please adjust the image contrast so it optimizes the area of interest the most. So when I say put it in the bone window, basically I want you to adjust the contrast of the image so that the bones look crisp, so that I can appreciate the anatomy of the bones the best. When I say put it in a stroke window, I'm saying make it so that the contrast of the image reflects the cerebral hemispheres the most, so I can optimize my image to see if there's any potential strokes. Okay? Okay, and now what we can do is appreciate the concept of windows in these two images. So on the left is a brain window, and what you can do is you can appreciate the cerebellar hemispheres very well here. Okay, you can see the white and gray matter. But look at the bone. I'd be very hard pressed to notice any pathology when they're so white. Okay, it's very hard to delineate any pathology. So when I put it in the bone window, look at what happens. The bone is so much more well contrasted. Okay. I can actually appreciate the anatomy of the actual bones and I'll be very easily spot a pathology, for example, a fracture. But on the hindsight, good luck appreciating any of the cerebral or cerebellar hemispheres. You can't appreciate anything, so you'd be a bit silly to be trying to comment on the actual brain hemispheres in this bone window, but you would be sensible to be commenting on the bones. So when I say put it in a certain window, I want you to basically optimize the image so that I can appreciate that anatomy the best. Now that we've gone through a whistle-stop tour of CT heads, the physics, orientation, terminologies, now let's start looking at common pathologies that you as foundation doctors and even junior doctors will often encounter in your day-to-day -day practice. The first one being CT heads. So CT heads are the bread and butter of most foundation training. It's important you have a systematic approach and it's important that you can recognize two main groups of pathologies. The first is bleeds and the second is infarcts. So in terms of a systematic approach to a CT head, the best way to actually have a system is to look at what the radiologist comments on. And this is just a generic report that we as radiologists often use when we're interpreting CT heads. And the reason why it's important and a useful uh, reference point is that when we describe our findings, we start with the most important, which is that there's no bleeds and that there's no territorial infarcts. Okay? Then we comment on whether there's any space-occupying lesions. Then we look at the gray-white matter differentiation. Then we look at the ventricles, the basal cisterns, the paranasal sinuses, orbits. Always make sure you look at the eyes. And then, of course, look at the bones to see if there's any fractures. So by going through the systematic approach, you'll make sure you don't miss anything on a CT head, but you'll start with the most important, especially as a junior doctor, can I see any bleeds or are there any infarcts? So now let's start off with the first bit, which is bleeds and seeing them on a CT head. So there's three main types you need to be aware of. There's subdural hematoma, subdural hemorrhage, 
extradural hemorrhage and of course subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a subdural hemorrhage is when there's stretching or breaking of a cortical vein, okay? And what then happens is that there's hemorrhage between the potential space between the dura and the arachnoid matter, okay? And the CT findings are characteristically that it's crescent-shaped, it's hyperdense because like we said uh, when we talked about the physics, blood is more dense than water, therefore it's more attenuating, less x-rays pass through it and therefore it appears white on a CT. It's extra-axial and importantly it can cross the suture line. And this is just a nice summary, so here is the crescent shaped, here is the lambdoid suture, it's a crescent shaped appearance, it's hyperdense, it's white, it's not as white as bone because bone is more dense than blood and like I said it can cross the suture lines. Here is the lambdoid suture and as you can see the actual subdural hemorrhages passes the actual suture line and this is an extra axial collection. An extradural hemorrhage is a tear in the artery, okay? And you get a pool of blood between the inner layer of the skull and the outer layer of the dura. And in terms of the CT findings, you get a lentiform or a biconvex shaped hyperdense collection, which is blood. It's extra axial, and unlike subdurals, a extradural cannot cross the suture lines. And often it is associated with a fracture, with the most common being in the parietotemporal region. And this is just an overview of a extradural hemorrhage, and you can see the collection of blood. And these are just the characteristic radiological findings. So you get this biconvex shape, as you can see in red. It's hyperdense, that why, that's why it appears white on a CT, but interestingly, it doesn't cross the suture lines. So what you can see here is the squamosomal suture, and here is the lambdoid suture. But look at the collection of blood. It doesn't cross the suture lines. As soon as it gets to the lambdoid suture, there's none thereafter. Same with the squamosomal suture, okay? And this is an extra axial collection as well. So which artery is the most commonly involved in extradural hemorrhage? The answer is the C, a middle meningeal artery. And the reason why is because the middle meningeal artery runs in a very vulnerable region known as the terion, which is this uh, shaded area here. At this point where the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the sphenoid bone and temporal bone all meet, it's a very vulnerable and weak area of the skull. And often when there's trauma, for example, in the MCQ, you may hear it as a blunt trauma to the side of the head. Think of a middle meningeal artery tear causing an extradural hemorrhage. And this is just a nice summary outlining the different appearances of an extradural, sometimes referred to as an epidural in the States, versus a subdural hematoma subdural hemorrhage. Finally, subarachnoid hemorrhage refers to blood in the subarachnoid space. Characteristically, in MCQs, you get this associated thunderclap headache. You have two main causes. One is trauma, and the other is an aneurysm rupture. Classically, it will be described to you in the case that they've either had trauma, then you know what the cause is, or they just wake up with a thunderclap headache, never had it before, found to a subarachnoid hemorrhage, typically due to a rupture of an aneurysm. Often people think that CT is the gold standard test. It isn't. The lumbar puncture is. Okay. All CT does is shows blood in the subarachnoid space. But if it's negative, i.e. the CT is normal, that doesn't mean we can rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You still need to do a lumbar puncture if clinically indicated. And this just outlines where in the subarachnoid hemorrhage you get blood which is in the subarachnoid space which is highlighted in red. And this is just a characteristic appearance of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You get blood in the cisterns, often you get this star appearance, and this is very characteristic of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the key takeaway from all this is that these are all neurosurgical emergencies, and you need to speak with the neurosurgeons ASAP to discuss what this next uh, stepwise management of the patient is going to be. Do they need conservative management or do they need to be uh, taken to neurosurgery for any operative uh, management? Having now discussed the bleeds, now let's talk about ischemia. 
basically stroke on a CT head. Now people often get confused why we do CT head and stroke. They often think that we do it to diagnose stroke. That's not the case. Stroke is a clinical diagnosis. The reason we do it is to exclude intercerebral hemorrhage, which is a major contraindication to thrombolysis. Yes, we can sometimes see early features of ischemia, but also what we can do with CT is to identify any mimics of stroke. For example, it may be a space-occupying lesion that's causing the hemiplegia, not necessarily a stroke. Okay? And there are three main groups of findings. There's the hyperacute ischemic findings, which is defined as 0 to 24 hours acute which is 24 hours to one week and subacute which is one week to three weeks and when we're talking about the hyperacute slash acute phase the characteristic sign is a hyperdense or a dot appearance of a vessel this basically tells you that there's a thrombus in the actual vessel causing stroke and what you're seeing in front of you are two different CT heads for two different patients, just showing you this, the hyperacute slash acute features. This is a hyperdense vessel. This is the right middle cerebral artery. Look on the opposite side. Where's the left? That's because there's no clot on the left side. And that is why the right one appears dense, because there's a clot in the actual right middle cerebral artery. And this is what we talk about when we're talking about the dot sign. Once again, this is the left middle cerebral artery. And if you look on the opposite side, where is it on this side? It shouldn't be there because if it does, it means that there's a clot in the actual artery. And often it can appear as subtle as this. So this is the dot sign and this is a hyperdense uh, vessel. When we're talking about subacute, often what we find is that there's a loss of the gray white matter differentiation on a CT head. And also you may this see this cortical hypodensity with parenchymal swelling. And the best way to show it is just to show you guys through an image. And this is just an image showing you the classical subacute features of a stroke. So once again, you can see this loss of gray white matter differentiation. The great thing about CT heads is you've got two sides to compare. Look on the actual patient's left side you can see the grey-white matter differentiation very well. Okay, You can see all the sulci, all the uh, gyrus. On the patient's right side, where is it? It's nowhere to be seen. You just see this massive di lacking differentiation part, and it's just so swollen. Okay, This is a classical sign of a subacute stroke, where there's this loss of grey-white matter differentiation. And one thing that's quite interesting and more academic purposes nowadays is you can actually figure out the vascular territory affected by looking at the area of grey-white matter differentiation loss. So this is just a nice summary image we took from Radiopedia. And what you can do is you can look at the area where there's a loss of grey-white matter differentiation. And by doing so, you can see what likely vascular artery is affected. So as you can see, looking at the image, this is most likely a middle cerebral artery stroke. Because if you look at the vascular territory, this area is supplied by the middle cerebral artery, in this case the right middle cerebral artery. And because there's a loss of great white matter differentiation in this region, then we can be confident that the actual stroke has impacted the right middle cerebral artery uh, brain uh, supply. Having now done heads, let's move on to CT chest. So let's talk about pneumothorax. So pneumothorax refers to gas in the pleural space. There's two main types, a tension or a simple. Please note simple can become a tension, and a tension basically refers to when there's life-threatening compromise, cardiovascular compromise. The causes are three. You can have primary spontaneous, where there's no lung pathology, secondary spontaneous, where there's an underlying pathology, and iatrogenic slash trauma. Now, the role of CT in pneumothorax is often specifically in the trauma setting. The starting point, and often where they're mainly picked up, is a actual chest x-ray. But please remember, a pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. You should not be waiting for a chest x-ray, and you should definitely not be waiting for a CT to diagnose a pneumothorax. If you clinically uh, suspect a pneumothorax, you should be treating a pneumothorax there and then, because they can become life-threatening emergencies. And the characteristic findings of pneumothorax are not very difficult to pick on CT. 
what you find is this large uh, free air in the pleural space. You see often this collapsed lung and typically the diagnosis is made there and then where you notice this uh, gas in the pleural space, collapsed lung, diagnosed with pneumothorax, get a treatment in there straight away. The second and more commonly diagnosed via CT is a pulmonary embolus. And basically it refers to an embolus. Uh, there's no need to be Einstein to figure that out in the pulmonary artery. Now the gold standard test is quite specific for the patient. If they're not pregnant, then we go straight to a CT pulmonary angiogram, a CTPA. But if they're pregnant, then we prefer to do a ventilation perfusion, otherwise known as a VQ scan. But of course, it's if an emergency and it's like 2 a.m. where we can't do a VQ scan and we need to do a CTPA, then of course we would need to speak with the senior, speak with the radiologist to see if the risks of exposing the patient and the unborn baby to ionizing radiation that comes from a CT is less than the benefits of potentially diagnosing a clot. Okay, And of course, the risk of PE is stratified using a well score. You need to stratify the risk to determine whether we need to do a CTPA or whether we can potentially treat them and then do a different imaging later on. And the main finding with the pulmonary embolism, well, it's an embolism. And this appears as a dark region in the pulmonary arteries. And the best way to show it is, of course, by just showing you an image. And this is what we mean. What you notice here is that in the pulmonary arteries, what you notice is this dark region of hyperattenuating substance. And this is the actual clot in the pulmonary arteries. Okay. And this is the pulmonary trunk coming out. And what you notice is that this clot is both in the right and on the left side. And what we call this is we call it a saddle embolus. Okay. And these are more concerning because at any time there is a risk that both the right and left will both basically block, causing a complete lack of blood supply to the lungs. Okay. And that can cause death. Now moving on to CT abdomens. Now when it comes to CT abdomens, we probably need to talk on its own. But when it comes to the F1, F2 and early stages of being a doctor, the main thing you're looking for is a perforation, which basically refers to free gas in the abdomen. Now the first line investigation is not a CT, it's an erect chest x-ray to see if there's air under the diaphragm. Now you may see air, on, air under the diaphragm, but that doesn't tell you why there is air. And that is why you would then move on to get a CT abdomen because it's the gold standard test in the initial stages to figure out what the possible pathology is that's causing the perforation. And what you notice with a abdominal perforation, otherwise known as a pneumoperitoneum, is there's an abnormal collection of air which appears dark because it's not dense. Therefore, more x-rays pass through it, means that it appears um, dark on a CT in the abdominal cavity. Okay, And this abnormal pocket of air is what we refer to as a pneumoperitoneum. Now, because the patient is lying flat, CTs are taken with the patient lying flat, the air will move up towards the top of the abdominal cavity. Okay, Because just gravity working uh, to push the abdominal organs down meaning the air will rise to the top, okay? So if there's abdominal perforation, often you will see the air rising to the top. So now let's go through the answers to the pop quiz. So what does CT stand for? The answer is C, computed tomography. Question two, who is this rather handsome gentleman? I wish it was Sir Muhammad Khan, maybe one day touch wood, but of course it's A, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, who invented the CT, the principles of CT, and uh, led to the name of the Hounsfield unit. The Hounsfield unit of air on CT is D, zero, because everything is relative to air. So air is given a Hounsfield unit of zero. Spot diagnosis, this is a right-sided extradural hematoma. The reason why, you've got this biconvex lentiform appearance. It's hyperdense. It doesn't seem to cross the suture lines and I would be concerned that there's a possible fracture 
that I need to put into the bone window so I can see if there's any fractures underlying the right-sided extradural hematoma. Spot diagnosis for this, this is a right middle cerebral artery infarct. You've got a loss of the gray-white matter differentiation. This is classically the right middle cerebral artery territory, so I can be confident in saying that this is a right middle cerebral artery infarct. This spot diagnosis is a right-sided pneumothorax. The lung has collapsed. There's abnormal air in the pleural cavity, and this is likely a pneumothorax, maybe secondary to trauma. We're not sure as in this stage, but looking at the other side of the lung, these are characteristic uh, features secondary to smoking. So it could be a secondary pneumothorax because there may be underlying chest pathology. This is a saddle pulmonary embolus. You can see the clot saddling both the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. This is a medical emergency like all pulmonary embolus, but there's a risk in this because it saddles both the right and left that it could completely block both at any certain time. And the answer to question eight, uh, this is a pneumoperitoneum, basically free air within the abdomen due to a perforation of a viscous, and we need to figure out what the viscous is that's perforated by doing a CT abdomen. So just to recap, CT is now routine. Nobody expects you to report a CT or act prior to a CT report. CT head findings are the most important to be aware of as a junior doctor, especially as an F1, F2. If in doubt, please escalate to your senior. If you're still in doubt, speak to us as radiologists. We are friendly people, I promise. And radiology is an awesome specialty, and we encourage everyone to consider it when choosing their future subspecialties.